Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Do not worry. I'm not going to speak for too long. It's Elodie who's going to present um, most of uh, our presentation. It's better uh, for everyone. Uh, sorry for my French, but uh, um, it seems that it's more convenient uh, if I speak French, uh, but I may make mistakes. Sorry for that. We'd like to present to you emerging sustainable technologies. But before we talk about technology, what uh, LD is going to do, uh, I'd just like to uh, introduce the topic. So, so before we start in this document that is available uh, that you can share with the external world, we're going to give you the link at the end. We present technologies that we believe will have an impact on us, Angie, today, that will have an impact on our future, most likely, and that may uh, impact uh, Angie directly and indirectly um, with regard to uh, our current and also planned activities. Three things uh, to um, insist on uh, sustainable and the technologies that LD is going to present um, are technologies that we think are more sustainable uh, than what exists on the market today. Um, renewable is not always sustainable, environment is not CO2 and sustainable includes also social aspects. The difference between renewable and sustainable it's not uh, complicated, but uh, people are sometimes confused between the two, and the two terms are used uh, uh, as if uh, it, they meant the same thing. Renewable, it means that um, uh, those are sources of energy uh, that are naturally replenished uh, on a human time scale that is 80 to 100 years. Sustainable is much broader. You've got the environmental aspect, social aspect, and economic aspect. So just to say that not everything that is renew renewable is sustainable. That's a concept that is interesting. It is the planetary boundary concept. Uh, it's people from Sweden who published that in 2015, and they tried to calculate on nine planetary boundaries uh, what the situation is today. And you can see that for uh, two uh, of them, we have gone uh, through the uncertainty threshold. Uh, for biochemical flows, phosphorus and nitrogen, because of all the uh, pesticides and fertilizers used, and also uh, biodiversity. Now, for climate change, according to those uh, Swedish authors, we are still in uh, an area where it's not too late, but almost too late. Uh, this is uh, the, the yellow part for uh, land system change. We are already also in an uncertainty uh, zone. So it's not only on climate change that we've got to focus. It is important, but it's not the only subject. That's an example. We have calculated, and there's one missing, um, says he, that's a study that we've done, a life cycle assessment. And in such an assessment, we try to look at all of the environmental impacts on life cycles uh, of uh, the different uh, technologies for PV, for coal, uh, linite, gas, to produce one kilowatt hour of electricity. What is the impact? Um, what is the level of CO2 emissions? For um, PV and wind, we are also going to look at production. And not only uh, how much CO2 is emitted during the production, 
for, for PV, there's no CO2 emissions, obviously. Uh, when we do that, that's for brown coal, the, the, the coal that is used mostly in Germany. That's uh, tr traditional uh, coal, hard coal, natural, natural gas. Um, photovoltaic, uh, that's what is uh, installed in Belgium, in France. Uh, in France, you see that the impact is less. It is clear that for wind, it's 10 grams, for example, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. For uh, photovoltaic, it changes according to the technology, but uh, it's between 30 and 100, well, 80 grams of CO2 emitted uh, by uh, the production, uh, the production of the panels, uh, because it's quite energy intensive, the production of the panels. Uh, you, you need uh, to recourse to mining. For natural gas, it's 500, and you can see that the construction of the power plant um, doesn't play a big role. It's mostly emissions during combustion, and for coal, it's about 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That's for CO2. So it's good to have wind and photovoltaic uh, with regard to CO2, but um, as I was saying in an assessment of life cycle, we also uh, look at the emissions of uh, particulates. Uh, so it's uh, in kilograms of uh, particulates, um, less than five microns. It's a bit different there. Um, so with the photovoltaic, we shouldn't do uh, worse. Than with, than with gas or even coal to produce electricity. And that's related to the PV panels that are used in Europe. Uh, they take their origin in China and it's very energy intensive, as I was saying. So um, it is done with electricity that uh, is produced with coal in China where they don't have a really good uh, technology to um, process the uh, fumes. Um, there, there might be a particulate filter, but mm, that's it. So even if we use photovoltaic panels here, uh, maybe um, we, we um, have more of an impact in terms of particulates. Yeah, I don't mean to say uh, all uh, PV panels should be destroyed, but it's just to show an example uh, to make people understand that one should on, only look at CO2 emissions um, and we should look at different steps. That's another example that I think is interesting to say that it's not uh, only a matter of CO2. Uh, in uh, 1700, if we had some iron and semen uh, and no uh, coal, we could do uh, whatever we uh, liked. But with uh, renewable energy uh, sources, you need plenty of uh, minerals, metals. So we've got to do um, mining of all of those elements. And it doesn't only have an, an environmental impact, but more and more. And it's true for cobalt, uh, there are a social and ethical aspects related to it. Um, so zero carbon, yes, but uh, there's not only carbon, we should look at all of the other aspects. So that's just the introduction to say that uh, the technologies that LD is going to present, um, we, uh, for, well, for, to, for those technologies, we all had that in mind. And last one, but I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, you've got uh, the social aspects again, and especially with um, artificial intelligence, there are um, technological challenges, but mostly social challenges. Uh, do we really want uh, what is being developed now? Uh, Asimov. Uh, you know, um, wrote the three laws of robots in 1942. Uh, maybe it's a time to think about his words again. It's, it's not because we want to do it that we should do it, and vice versa. So, 
uh, that's the introduction uh, to all of the technologies that LLT is going to present. Uh, if you have questions, do not hesitate. She knows about everything. And if she doesn't know something, uh, we can uh, call upon another expert. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody, to the people connected via Zoom also. So I'm going to present to you the sustainable technology that has been identified in 2019, answering three questions. The emerging sustainable uh, technology that we identified last week with the expert, 900 experts from uh, ENSHI. And I will try, the second question that I will try and answer is how do they work in summary because we have about three quarters of an hour to present the technology and the third one i believe that could be interesting is to know how they can impact your life and the business tomorrow and already have an impact on your activity in your business so we're going to have i'm going to present to you five of these technologies that are electrochemical storage radiation cooling um, co2 cycles biotechnology and green mobility so they're all available for everyone on Yammer. Now let's start with electrochemical storage. What is new in batteries? Uh, to store electricity is something, it's a technology that is very well known, has been used for a particularly long time, particularly through lead uh, batteries that you have in your cars. We're also using a lot of conventional lithium ion batteries that have these properties and advantages that are in order energy density, long life cycle, and the performance today is notable. And we're using in the uh, cell phone, tablets, batteries, for scooters, and electric bicycles for whoever has one. But it also has main drawbacks, such as a safety. If there's an explosion a risk that is not to be neglected, the cost, this lifetime, and also the reaction to temperature. Then we're thinking, well, we have the experts uh, from NG research identified technology upon which we're working, which are considered as more sustainable for several aspects. So we're going to, to list them, the redox flow batteries and the solid state batteries. Now the redox flow batteries, um, as the uh, image is explaining on the right, is a system based on um, two electrolytes. Uh, semi-negative and semi-positive cells, so it's a transfer of protons that allows electricity production, and those protons are circulating within this electrolyte. So it's split by a membrane, and we combine in this technology electrochemistry and mechanics. Mechanics is for pumping this electrolyte and therefore this fluid that is circulating. The advantages of this technology is the cost, it's a low energy cost and the less sensitivity to temperature, which is quite interesting with regard to the lithium one. So we are thinking not only to put it in your scooter, but to store excess electricity from uh, electric power. So we can play on two aspects the energy and the power. For the power, you have to increase the electrical surface. And to add energy, you increase tank side on both sides. The challenge, nevertheless, is to work on the cost and also on the risk of leakage, since we're on a fluid that uh, is slightly harmful. So we have those two aspects that we have to work on to optimize it, uh, to put it on the market. So we imagine this technology would be ready in 2025 or in the next uh, 10 years. Another one in the batteries that we identify as emerging and sustainable is solid state battery. That has a system that is similar to lie ion battery but functions with electrodes and a solid membrane. So the pro advantage is that it's safer than the lithium ion batteries because we can avoid short circuits, internal short circuits. And we have also potential of a density that is much higher. So in fact, you have to heat 
this battery for it to work. So the problem is how are you going to make them work at normal temperature, a low temperature, and the high self-discharging. So we still have challenges. The idea is not to say that all technology that we presented today are ready for market, but they're emerging because they have already a technological advantage that shouldn't be neglected. And in our opinion, it could change the deal on storing electricity. So what is new in electricity? Well, now let's move on to what we could see, what could be done with cooling. The topic is a little bit difficult. I want to try and explain to you as simply as I can because we identify technology leaning on intercellular cold. After Star Wars recently, we're not a joke, but it's a real technology that has been documented and which, that is based on the, the reservoir of the space that is less than 270 degrees and in fact presents capability of cooling that are infinite because of the reflection of some waves, ultra-red, that are going through what we call the transparency window of the atmosphere. I will explain to you this in detail, contrary to the waves of the, but that are reflected by the atmosphere. These have the capacity to go through space and therefore we can cool hot body that are on Earth. The principle is that the idea is to emit more heat than we receive. So the technology is lying on what we're calling a, a nano coating. It's like a painting that you could apply to a surface, any type of surface actually. The idea is you coat on any type of body that has to be cooled. And therefore you have here hot water circulating here and being cooled throughout the emission of this excess heat. So the power of this nano coating, and this is where technology is rely, is the capacity of reflecting this infrared waves in between eight and 13 microns. So they have a capability to go through the atmosphere and then travel to space. It's quite a revolution because with this nano coating that can apply everywhere, you can imagine a lot of solution for cooling. Of course, we're not going to manufacture ice in the middle of a desert at noon in the Sahara. The idea is to cool bodies from three to six degrees. This is what the tests are showing. We're working notably on a pilot in Saint-Denis to test this process. And we're working in partnership with various companies and startups, SkyCool and CoolGirl, to start this technology. So it's significantly impacting for us and emerging and impacting energy because we can cool water. You can also diminish the fluid that are, uh, uh, are freezing, that are quite polluting. And it's also a way of fighting Climatic change, uh, sorry, the uh, hothouse uh, gas, because rather than put air con to all your building, you can imagine solutions that are slightly more sustainable on cities that could be, could have excessive variation of temperature. As, as an anecdote, I'm sure that you saw this phenomenon known operate in your gardens because the cross is reflecting those waves, those infrared waves. And I'm sure you noticed already that grass could be frozen as it was not even zero degrees because grass has this capacity of reflecting in between eight and 13 microns waves. So this were inspired us from this idea. Now at NG, there's a strong impact that we think is gonna happen because we have a lot of services linked to cooling for food and energy st storage and so forth. Without any transition at all, another challenge that we have to face is CO2. So we identified also technologies that are emerging and sustainable to manage CO2 and see how we could reuse it properly to fabricate molecule at high added, added value. So the technology that we're presenting here is an alternative to what you know very well which is the combined cycle that you see on the left. 
So this combined cycle is combustion of CH4 plus air in a turbine, and it's the water steam that is producing electricity. The idea here is that with the technology of net power, that is, uh, is to manufacture electricity with a fluid that is CO2. So in fact, we have first step, air here, that is purified, so we're directly with pure oxygen, we're not with nitrogen anymore, we're distracting from uh, air. So it goes to a water separation unit, and it's um, combined with CH4, we have combustion, and the CO2 is um, powering the turbine. So the CO2 is super critical at high temperature, at high pressure, so the challenge is dual. Here for a manufacturer, there is a structure that can and a very high pressure and high temperature. But we already have uh, operators working on this technology to make them, uh, uh, to put them on the market. And the other challenge is the cost of the separation between oxygen and nitrogen. So here we are a flow, a gas, that is concentrated at 90% in CO2. So the interest for a chemist or industrial is having a key CO2 of this pure quality to use it in various uh, possibilities, which I'm going to show you very rapidly here. Since CO2, what are we looking for in CO2? Of course, is carbon, carbon, which is the base of some molecules of nutrients, particularly, but also fuel, like methanol, methyl, polymer. But also, CO2 can be used in drinks, it could be used for material, and of course, for plastics. So to reach this combination of carbon with hydrogen, because every time it's a combination of CO and H, we have certain processes that are here, thermic and chemical and biologic, the list is quite large, photosynthesis is biological, the carbonation in food industry, polymerization, mineralization, fermentation, hydrogenation, and co-electrolysis. All these technologies are explained in very well detail in all our technology position paper, TTPs, that I'm suggesting to look at them. I'm advertising also a little bit. To, uh, so the advantage of technology is that not much capex, not so many material and capability of implementing it quite rapidly. And the CO2 that you can reuse, it's very important that. So we can and forecast the interest to have a new generation for CH4. Here we're on natural gas and it can be renewed if we put biogas for methanization and gasification. Now the first unit, the first demonstration is units that are uh, small, even if it's 500 megawatt, it means that net power thinks that if this uh, demonstration presents an interesting result, as soon as 2021, they're going to invest in what we call full scale, so industrial scale, for 300 megawatt units. So in 2021, we're emerging of a technology that's sustainable at short-term basis. Now, this presentation of CO2 allows me very naturally to switch to biotechnologies and energy, because biotechnology and energy, bioenergy, so to speak, are based on this carbon that is available in nature, in vegetal, but also in fossil energy. Small reminder of definition, the difference in between biotechnology and bioenergy. The distinction is notable. The biotechnology is uh, using. Mm, ooh, size is gone. Okay. Go back there. So, biotechnology are using living systems and organisms. Typically, you're yourself a biotechnology since you're producing stuff. And these biotechnologies are different from bioenergies and biofuels, which are renewable energies produced from biological sources and biomass. And we're looking for to use the carbon of this biomass. It's not the biomass as such that it's going to manufacture its energy. It requires a process, thermical, thermal, or thermal chemical, to produce it. But it would be too simple 
if the biofuels, for instance, could also be produced by biotechnologies. Typically, if we take digestion in every, those are bacteria that are themselves have the capability of producing CH4, biomethane. So we hear on bioenergy, same thing for all types of fermentation and also for algae. Algae is in fact capable of producing altogether an organism capable of producing energy, but also bioenergy. Now, the idea of what uh, we have is not very new, it exists in nature, and we're just trying to exploit it, uh, basing on the knowledge of nature and technology of nature to produce energy. Nevertheless, what is, has to be highlighted is this capability of some bacteria to produce fuels in absence of light and oxygen, because light is a source of energy that we all need to manufacture something, the molecule, we always need energy, so they're capable of manufacturing a molecule with, in the absence of light and oxygen. So how do they function, those bacteria? Well, we have monoxide of carbon and CO2, we're adding on hydrogen, and we are putting this in a fermentation tank that we feed with electricity, because of course we need energy to fabricate these uh, molecules, and from this fermentation, we can produce acetate, for instance, ethanol, butane, and hydrogen. And we can also manufacture, or certain people can, plastic precursors. Therefore, the idea of what we call biomaterial. Now, several industries and several companies already started this adventure of uh, fabricating biocarbon fuel in absence of light and oxygen, because uh, Vito, for instance, making this precursor for plastic. We also have uh, cross jetty from CO2 that produce methane. We have electro -K that is also producing methane from CO2. The uh, we're, uh, technology where energy invested throughout the NG lab, um, hydrogen, oxygen, Ineos Bio, and Lanzet Tech. And all this technology have a diversity of TRL, what we call the levels of technology. They're not all ready to launch on the market, but we're capable quite rapidly to go from TRL 5 to TRL 9 to industrialize it. And here, all this technology are based on the valorization of CO2. So CO2 is, CO2 is becoming a resource. Now, the emerging biotechnology for hydrogen production can also be done in, pre in the presence of light and oxygen, which is the most current cases, of course, or the most well-known process in nature, thanks to bacteria, particularly Rhodobacter capsulatus, um, <laughs> which produces a stew from organic acid, i.e. a lactate or acetate, what we call a lactate, which is the residue of fabrication of butter, for instance. The idea here is that we need energy, i.e. the light, that is in the job, because light manufacture ATP, the first basic molecule of energy, to manufacture synthetic molecules with added value based also on oxygen. So it's a nitrogen ions that is allowing to make nitrogen. We have here an example of biotechnology that can produce hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, on a basis that is quite significantly available since the milk industry is making a lot of this milk. Let's go, the transition is quite difficult to do in between green mobility. Nevertheless, we all need to eat and we all need to move about. So I'm going to try and, Green mobility, I believe, is one of the topics that perhaps you're the most knowledgeable. So I'm going to try and explain to you how we are seeing this technology emerging, particularly concerning this green mobility. The first one is what we call the Hyperloop, that I'm sure you know, you heard about it. Thanks to the communication of Elon Musk. And uh, is an idea 
crazy or not, in any case, since the first publication in 2013, we see appear in with certain demonstration and solution that are developing through the world. It's based on electromagnetic uh, field so that a train can uh, circulate on distances that are quite significant, as you see, between San Francisco and LA. Now, the advantage of this technology is that it's independent of climatic conditions, no question a tree falling on rails because of a storm. We have resilience and resistance to earthquakes, so it could be interesting, particularly in this particular region. And it's also CO2 free and it's no noise also. So it's uh, quite interesting. Now, we're new reality, why is that? Because we're observing a certain number of projects that are studying it various consortia and the first one is Virgin Hyperloop One. We're having Hyperloop transportation technologies also, transport, hard Hyperloop, and this question of difference is a difference of type of technology. I'm not an expert, so we're not detailed, it, but we're not exactly in the same operation of levitation active or passive. What you can see here is that NG is following hard hippo loop or uh, participate to its uh, assessment. So this is for terrestrial transport. Now for air and transport, the yeah, issue is to find uh, a sustainable fuel. That's a real challenge. And I believe that this sector has problems ahead of it because it's quite complex. Kerosene is a fuel that's quite extraordinary easy to transport and so forth with properties that are not to be neglected or hydrogen could, according to what we're thinking, contribute to decarbonation of this sector, not for propulsion, because as you see here, we would need tanks of an incredible volumes in terms of aerodynamism, we would lose a lot in terms of containment, it would be too heavy. Nevertheless, we can take hydrogen to produce electricity on uh, in the plane or on the tarmac. So that could be a pathway and Airbus is working on it, Saffron is also working on it. So it's uh, starting. Nevertheless, for the issues of propulsion, we still have a non-negligible issue, which is what uh, fuel can be replaced with kerosene. The biofuels, our solution, but uh, to add the power to liquid also, based on electricity that is on excess, we produce hydrogen with a resource of CO2. CO2 and hydrogen are manufactured, a jet fuel, so carbon and hydrogen, and we're reaching power to liquids to fuel planes. Nevertheless, we have a negative issue here and sources that are, work, are working on it, which is a cost that is extremely expensive of this technology. Since we are largely not as productive today, so the manner of capturing CO2 and the manner of producing hydrogen will have a combination to find and to optimize in order to reach a renewable fuel for aviation sustainable over time. We have now went through five technologies on the nine that we identified last year. So if we come back on the pattern that uh, Ian presented, energy today, energy in, the energy in the future, emerging technology, we didn't talk about quantum computing, 3D metal printing and self learning material because at short time, I don't think it will impact our activities on a short term basis. Nevertheless, we saw today Electromagnetic storage that is new in batteries. The CO2 cycle and the 3T metal printing that we not, did not present, but has also an important impact on manufacturing. So for these other technologies that are radiative cooling, biotechnologies, self-healing material and green mobility, these are technologies that, according to us, have a dual advantage. They're sustainable. 
they present in the case properties of sustainability that are not to be neglected with regard to what exists today on the market and are in phase of being emerging within five or ten years. So keep an eye on it, monitor it, think of how they could impact your business tomorrow. Like internet happened in the 90s, you knew how it was going to impact your day-to-day -day life. Well, but 10 or 15 or 20 years later, we see how it affected your activities. So you can imagine that the technologies will have also a revolution tomorrow in your business. All the questions that you could have and that you could uh, can start now, we're going to start a Q&A session together. And all the supplementary additional questions that you can address to our experts. I'll uh, suggest that you go and check this presentation on uh, the platform and the research, and you will find the edition of the past years and next edition in 2020, and meet us on Yammer on Technology Awards Group to get informed on all the technologies that we identified. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to let you now place for your questions. There's a number of questions uh, via Zoom that uh, we will answer. Well, first, thanks a lot. I work in the GMBU. I've just finished a call with a customer that is called uh, World Fuel Services uh, about planes, etc. So, if we want to sell energy, five terawatt hour of energy, what can we propose to those customers in terms of sustainable energy? I've got several questions. What energy we can produce? Well, today, very concretely, we can produce biomethane. If we use plane that were on gas before, and otherwise hydrogen, for batteries and fuel cells of planes that are on a tarmac or that are produce, producing electricity on board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the person is not using a microphone, so I can't translate. This microphone doesn't work. For, for the production of uh, synthetic kerosene, you need a base of CO2, like I already explained. But the most important, and it is also where the, the higher costs are, is hydrogen, because you've got to combine CO2 with hydrogen to uh, make kerosene. And we can do that at a large scale, we believe. Uh, uh, to uh, make synthetic kerosene. So, and then we could reach a, a high uh, level of uh, terawatt hour. Yeah, I've got several questions. We are organ organizing an innovatum uh, with industrial clients. We uh, provide energy, they um, are very much uh, in, in uh, demand um, with regard to what you talked about. But, well, first of all, I do not understand why we only advertise the solutions on Yama. Isn't there a LinkedIn page? Uh, have you put anything on li LinkedIn? Is it public? I understand your question, sir. Do you want to communicate externally these uh, communication? I believe that there are many uh, clients that are a bit lost when they visit ng.com and they wonder what ng can provide. We have communicated a lot about hydrogen biomass. Um, it's interesting, but it's a pity for the work that you do. Uh, that, uh, well, people don't uh, access the, the information you gave us. Thank you for the feedback. This year, 
I, what I presented is the draft that is internal, confidential, but also wrote a public version. It's the first one, actually, of this document. And we published it on Twitter and LinkedIn in December 2019. So they were published by our own accounts on LinkedIn and ResearchGate also. But to my knowledge, uh, we also had by uh, yeah, raised, uh, networks, but not on an NG public account. And it, it's interesting to know that people could be interested by the presentation, so we're going to continue uh, publishing the public version with no comments or no subjectivity. Okay. Third question, thanks a lot. Third question, when you talk about sustainability, according to me, well, sustainability is about preserving the resources of the earth for future generations. But when you talk about all these technologies, uh, you have looked at the value chain that those techno technologies um, could uh, present. Do you want to answer? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now, the sustainability, in fact, uh, it's just that our criterion of selection, emerging technology, is not only talking about the emerging aspect of it, because every day you're hearing about a, a radio, internet, newsletter, you have a million newsletters in your mailbox, which are really technologies that we think are emerging, but on top of it, what we want to take into account is sustainability, because it's a challenge that we cannot work otherwise, and sustainability, we hope, that those criteria are going to be complied with when the technology is developed and it's not only linked on CO2. That's the idea. And we hope to be able to keep this label all along the uh, selection. And there's a lot about much by Anne, uh, where they assess uh, life cycles. Last question. I'd like to get back to planes because it's very important. I've not quite understood how it works. The production. In the way the aircraft uh, works, uh, I've understood that you can produce hydrogen uh, whilst uh, the plane is flying. Or do you have a technology that does that? No, no. You see, sir. No. No, it's about using hydrogen when uh, the plane is on tarmac for a PU or auxiliary power units. Um, you know, there are stationary uh, aircrafts in airports and, uh, and uh, basically you, you can um, use hydrogen to produce electricity, but we don't believe that it would be uh, possible for takeoff or landing. And uh, but it would, it would be too to make synthetic kerosene with CO2 and hydrogen. I'll take a few questions on Zoom because some per, maybe 100% are connected. So I'll start with the simplest, which is the name of our group in, in uh, Yammer. It's Technology Watch. It's Biomethane, green hydrogen and batteries. Yes, the answer is yes. And the green hydrogen... <clears throat> Yeah. For green hydrogen, we, we have John that is here in Saint -Denis. Oh, I think I found the way uh, I'm supposed to use the mic, says he. So that is in Paris, but for the batteries lab, it's near Brussels. Uh, you, you can see big uh, tests of uh, li lithium ion batteries. You are all invited to, to come and visit it. And the battery flow also that uh, LD explained about. Could you specify the Paris core versus nuclear? PV score, I think it refers to the life cycle of PV panels in comparison with nuclear. Well, um, if you look at nuclear, um, it, it's very, a very good idea in relation to CO2. Uh, because if you uh, assess nuclear energy, it's between 10 and 15 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour produced. Uh, that's related to uh, the mining of uranium. 
and its transportation to uh, the power uh, plant. So for CO2, you are, it's the same uh, level as a win. Uh, but there are other impacts, uh, radiation. Uh, you've got a problem with waste. So it's very good for CO2, but you've got the challenge of the radioactive wastes. You, you, so you may have technologies that are very good in one category, very good for CO2 emissions, for example, but that are worse than uh, the alternative um, in another category. So, again, everything has got to be considered. Is it, what is the most important? Um, climate change, then uh, we've got to fight climate change and reduce the level of CO2 emissions. But if you think that radiations may be uh, important, may have an impact, then um, you may think differently. Another question. I recall, in fact, already the first slide presenting all the co-authors of this presentation because we didn't do it alone. So I'm thanking them all, if, if, particularly if they're here. So these people can be contacted, of course, to have more details on each of the topics discussed. And also, uh, there's the technology position paper that you... Yeah, yeah, I've got to repeat it again and again. So you can find in uh, all of the details uh, about the technology. Position paper, maybe. That a position paper and consensual document from all the people in the group on the technology. So it's not only the researchers, the researchers of NG, it's everybody working on technology in NG. Yes, uh, no. Internal document. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can be a booster for sustainable solution. However, how is energy going to cope with the abnormal high energy consumption that is required for uh, artificial intelligence on a large scale? Eh bien, eh bien, eh bien, eh bien, c'est un challenge. Well, it is a challenge. We're working on it actually, particularly to cool the cryogenic cooling, if, to, to cool data centers. So we're not the only one to work on that topic. We also have our dear competitors, friends, Google, working on that too, to diminish their energy con consumption of data center, forecasting the development of uh, artificial intelligence. We're going to be huge consumers of energy, like just such computing, that of course is very greedy in energy. So we also have this issue of cooling to discuss uh, simultaneously. Another question from Philip concerning the PV panels. Would it be more correct to present also the fine particles emission from PV from renewable energy and nuclear? Then the information will be more complete and less biased. Hello, see. Yeah. Well, if you look at the full document, um, I said again, it wasn't to uh, kill the uh, photovoltaic. Uh, uh, it's just that we've got to think uh, of uh, producing um, photovoltaic panels with renewable energy. Um, I, I didn't want. I didn't mean to uh, blame everything on uh, photovoltaic panels. So, but for the time being, we have looked at it. It's very difficult, almost impossible to buy. Uh, photovoltaic panel produced with renewable energy on, on the market. It does not exist. All right, coming back, another question in the room. We still have time. Go for it. Uh, bonjour, Hélène Grandjean de Jim. Grandjean from Jim. I was two days ago in Brussels, where Mr. Jankovic was invited by Chatterbell to talk. Were you there, Jan? No. And his speech was to say that it was not renewable energy that were going to be enough to replace the other technologies. And he's very pro-nuclear, in fact. I believe that it's a very strong message that was carried by Chuck Bell. Which is the vision of NG on that? Well, 
we like energy research, uh, we, we, we don't, um, you know, um, establish the strategy of the group. Um, it, it is normally the board that does that. So maybe sh you, you should ask th that question of the board. At NG Research, we've got 22 labs. We don't have a nucle nuclear lab. Um, we do re research on nuclear, on nuclear energy, but it's done in the business units. I can't answer this question. Bonjour. Uh, good afternoon, Ansel Prieto, GBS. You've talked about cool roof, cold roof, to be photovoltaic, so in the face of uh, the decision of Bill of mm, constructing a building or renovating the roof, is it better to, to do uh, cold roofing or uh, is it better to have uh, PV panels? Well, uh, to, today it's not mature enough, um, uh, this kind of cool technology. And we believe that we can reach 250 watts per square meter, but with a PV panel, um, you know, it's more than 300. So I believe that in terms of efficiency to, to produce as much energy as, pos as possible, it's photovoltaic, um, uh, the photovoltaic solution. If you want to produce as much electricity, as much energy as possible, then it's better to uh, use uh, PV panels. Okay, so I take another question on Zoom. Can you sp split the ver public version of our research so we can relate on the networks? Yes, we have a public version with on top of it a message that is calling for collaboration of research of universities and external research center to work with us. So of course, I will give you the link through the Techno Watch Group. That is not available. Other question, can you give me a contact for storing energy to uh, operate an electric motor in autonomy of the network for an exercise group? We're using motor pump groups, such as a truck motor. I think we will check it before we can answer. Over, over. Oui, Benoît, Benoît. Well, maybe Benoît is going to answer. No, we'll answer in writing. Other questions? Merci. Thank you. Um, I'm part of the lucky ones. For batteries, I'd like to know whether the lithium ion technology is not going to prevail. Not because it's the best one, but because uh, you have uh, scale savings uh, that are uh, so strong with Tesla, for example, that may maybe sometimes it's not the best one who wins. Clearly, it's not necessarily the best for winning, otherwise we wouldn't be uh, where we are at now. But I believe that indeed, uh, you have to keep in mind that the lithium-ion batteries the rectophone are not using the same type of storing or the same quantity. And uh, there is a technologically advanced that is not to be neglected. But if we're looking at criteria of sustainability, that of course lithium ion will have notable inconvenience and drawbacks that the other one won't have. So it that redox flow won't have. So it depends on the regulation that can influence the development of the technology. It's often actually what is the driver it can constrain to uh, growth? If I may intervene uh, as a complement to what you just said, uh, which is perfectly correct, uh, lithium uh, ion batteries have got um, running uh, slots that are well defined. Um, they are not fit for storing uh, electricity in the long run. Their uh, energy efficiency is the highest when they've got several cycles, numerous cycles. So if you want to store energy for several hours, lithium ion is not ideal because uh, those batteries have got internal losses. They've got to be cooled. It consumes energy. There's a self-release discharge of the battery. So for, uh, if you want to store energy for eight hours or more, you've got to develop new technologies. Um, Redox flow batteries could be uh, an answer. 
uh, lithium ion batteries uh, um, have benefited from uh, 40 years of development uh, if you compare with other technologies that are emerging um, you know uh, um, technologies that we've been working on for five to ten years so a technology that is uh, 40 years old uh, and it's the time uh, that was required to make it a mature uh, technology it takes a lot of time to uh, develop the industrial chain it's a technology that benefited a lot from the development of uh, electrical mobility. It is uh, supported by the development of electrical vehicles um, because it's got the highest density per volume of weight. That's why it is, uh, you know, at the head, uh, at the top, and it still has plenty of uh, good days in front of it, but it's got limitations, people realize now, in terms of performance um, or uh, security, safety, and um, other technologies could uh, overtake, it, overtake it in the coming years. The virtual power plant in Australia, somebody talked about, it seems, without a mic. Uh, lithium iron, uh, there are also batteries used in residential applications because it's the only technology that is mature today. The case of Australia is a specific one. Uh, you know, they uh, are developing virtual power plants, aggregating um, thousands of batteries. It's because they've got uh, problems of uh, networks uh, because of the high level of renewable energies. Uh, it's not the technology itself that counts, but it's the particular situation of the country and of its network. Uh, there are such that there's a favorable case of application uh, for uh, Tesla power walls and residential batteries. I think that in Europe, if we were to reach the same uh, level of penetration of renewable energies, we could see such uh, use cases uh, appearing also, but it's too early. Maybe we can talk again about it in 10 years' time. Maybe we're going to take the one, uh, one last question. Ellen, with... You can reach out to DOP Nuclear Mache Innovation and Technical Support Teams. Uh, Vasily Ki, tu, que tu connais, je pense, qui a répondu ça. I think Vasily answered that. And a very interesting question for us. According to you, the group, uh, does it devote enough time to identify, analyze, and capture the emerging technologies uh, in this time of transition? Well, no, there are only two of us. Uh, um, in, a, in a more serious uh, way, we, we could uh, do more with more resources. Last question. Two last question then. G solution. G solutions in the storage of uh, electricity, uh, technologies like metal uh, and super condensers. Um, those technologies, do they have an interest? Well, that's further on. It's um, about emerging, but we are uh, l looking at those technologies. If you want to have more information, um, well, contact the Angelab batteries. Uh, in the SharePoint, if you see the 23 labs and you can click on uh, one lab and see who is the manager, you can send an email. Uh, they're all very um, kind and intelligent. Last question, and I'll conclude. Energy, you talked in a general way about the sustainability, sustainability and uh, acceptance of different technologies. I'd like to know if you uh, are interested in this um, element of um, technological development, uh, bearing in mind that um, standardization is a tool that uh, makes it possible to gather all of the stakeholders and to facilitate this adaptation. Uh, 
and this acceptance and as an illustration uh, the standardization uh, the european standardization committee has decided to um, well create a committee for hyperloop that you talked about thank you for the information and indeed uh, we are also basing our sector a follow-up of uh, the researchers following the standards of the various themes that they're monitoring very important is to know the constraints that are applied to the current technologies and the technology that could emerge in the future. And I hope that the standards will be in favor of sustainability and take into consideration more than CO2. Now, I believe that today it's emerging, but as we saw the emerging part of the iceberg on technology, we'll have more details and much more information available on uh, all the deliverables that are uh, accessible to the group on, on their uh, sharing site. So we have an all sorts of information sources. Uh, Samuel is responsible of it too. And I want to thank you all for your presence today, for everybody who is connected via Zoom, and tell you about a presentation that will happen in Brussels in March for our friends uh, from Belgium who are not here today. And all these documents will be available, are already, but we'll republish them on Yammer and Technology Watch Group. So to thank you, there is a little bit of buffet and drinks that are available outside of the conference. Thanks to all of you and see you soon.